Welcome to Watching Silent Films. I'm here with this is Ifang, by the way, and I'm here with uh, Lily. Hello, Lily. And back with us is Diane from uh, a Silence Majority from of, of from the Wayback Machine archives. But um, hey, thank everybody. you, Diane, for reappearing and uh, making sort of uh, I don't know what we're gonna call this, but just sort of uh, we're gonna I guess try it, try it a few times and see what happens because uh, just some updates uh, for the rest of the listeners. Uh, Bob is gonna step down for the time being. Uh, he's working on a, a work project that is taken away. Uh, from this podcast in terms of the time. So unfortunately, he's going to uh, not be with us for now. Uh, but if, when he makes it back, uh, he'll he'll make it back. We don't know when that'll be. So we'll wish him well on his work adventures there. And hopefully he'll be able to complete this project and get back to it as soon as, as possible because we obviously love having him here and uh, contributing towards his uh, knowledge of films and film enjoyment and watching and criticism and so on. So that's the update. Um, in the meanwhile, uh, we're going to see how we, are, we work with uh, Diane here. And uh, the last few podcasts we've had are on, um, I guess it was the Mark of Zorro was one, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And what was the other one? I can't remember. Do you remember? Uh... Uh... <laughs> I was going to say it was a chaplain. No, I don't think so. Was it? No, it a was another... Back then? Um... Hmm? It was a thief of Baghdad or something else. It was the thief of Baghdad. All right, perfect. All right. Oh, yep, there we go. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't remember if it was two Douglas Fairbanks in a row or maybe it was something else. I, I just uh, my memory is escaping me, you know. <laughs> so, anyways, so that's just some updates on the podcast for the listeners there. And um, what we do here on the podcast is we pick a, a film or a series of shorts and we we talk about it. It's pretty much it. We watch it. The silent film, and we we talk about it. And this week, we're going to talk about I N R I, which is uh, a film about Jesus' cruc crucifixion from the same director, Robert Ween. We we kind of been going on his filmography uh, for a while now, so that's our uh, feature this particular week. Uh, but in the meantime, before that, I just want to see check in and see how if anybody's uh, watched anything recent. Uh, lately, I mean, or anything uh, classic recently? Sorry, I can't talk today. <laughs> well, I just saw anything Citizen the classic King realm. recently. You just watched what was it? Citizen Kane. I mean, you've seen that before, right? Mm. I assume. Oh, I've seen it many, many times, and I still think I don't know if it's the best movie ever made, but it's up there. It. Uh, I don't. I think it crossed a. A line of more modern films. That's one of the ways it makes it special. And I've never seen any other movie like it, really. But then I haven't seen any other all other films, so, you know. But uh, I watched 1941, it right? film group. 1941. Right. That's right. Orson Welles, the genius, essentially, artisan, uh, who... I believe conquer pretty much every medium he touches. Uh, have you seen uh, Citizen Kane, um, Lily? No, I haven't, and I was surprised we didn't have to watch it when I took that one film course in college. What kind of film course? What kind of film course doesn't have you watch Citizen Kane? <laughs> um, let's see, a liberal arts college. Let me tell you. <laughs> well, that, that's the ones that should be making you to watch, you know, Citizen Kane. You know. Yeah. What did we watch? We did watch. Uh, what was the? Oh jeez, the hair. What's the Harrison Ford movie? Blade Runner. <laughs> we had to watch that, and it was like such an epic. And I'm like, I did not care for Blade Runner at all. Maybe right. if I watched it again, but it's just you know that with its techno biologic warfare, gun slinging dudes in the '80s versus Citizen Kane, which is the most. A prolific movie of its time. No. But the book we have mentions it a whole bunch. Whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what do you what do you uh what what are the highlights and what do you like about it, Diane, that you, you revisit it many times? Um well for one, I did get to see it on the big screen, which makes a huge difference. Uh but 
I think that the, all of the elements that you need for a really good film are all present. You have great uh, acting. You have great camera work. You have great music. Uh, things that people don't really think about because they're busy watching a film. And, um, of course, it has the uh, backstory that people still talk about to this day, uh, where it involved William Randolph Hearst and his mistress, Marion Davies, which is partially true. Orson Welles said, no, we took it uh, from several different people and sort of put it together but it's really well put together it's not a mishmash it's uh really a classic and um what can i say about it it's uh i think that filmmakers have borrowed from that film over the years steven spielberg borrowed it for raiders of the lost ark um well, he even has a sled on his, uh, over his fireplace, if I'm allowed to give that away, the rosebud sled. So it's a film that starts and it comes full circle through a lot of paths of um, flashbacks. And I like the way it was put together. The editing is great. And the writing won an Oscar. And uh, that's a lot there to recommend it. I did have a um, discussion with several people. Some people hated it. Some people liked it like I did. I actually love that film. Um, and I think that Wells topped himself at the beginning of his career because after that, they had problems with him, sort of like an Eric von Sturheim, you know, spending too much money, um, going for visions, making things too long, um, uh, behavior like that that kept his projects from being finished fully. In fact, there's a little story uh, when he was making Macbeth that he ran out of money for costumes. And there was a scene that he turned into a steam bath scene. He got a bunch of sheets for the actors and he had them talking in a steam bath. And that way he got his costumes. So Wells is a very, um, I think he's a genius, but a sort of a self-destructive one. And I think that he took himself off to a very good start of having people who loved him and people who hated him. So, but that was the beginning. And he, of course, he made a dent in radio, which uh, was shocking with the uh, War of the Worlds. So, I like him. I've seen a lot of... Uh, interviews with him and uh, the man has been around so you say that somebody's been around the block well he's been around the world several times and he's met a lot of people and has a lot to say or did yeah I uh, the reason why I stayed in the beginning that he conquered all multiple mediums is that he was kind of like a child prodigy, and he actually never graduated formal school, uh, whether it was elementary or junior high or high school. Basically, out of the, almost, essentially out of box, as it were, quote unquote, he was able to read, write, and create art at an extremely young age. And by the time he was either 18 or, you know, during his teens, he basically conquered theater. He ran. Uh, multiple theater productions that were just revolutionary. Um, the thing that he's noted on his Wikipedia in is that he did, um, what was it? Othello with an all-black cast or something like that. It was one of the Shakespearean plays. Don't quote me on that. I can't remember which. Which was revolutionary because one of the Shakespearean plays references the character as being uh, the darker skin or whatever. And so he was one of the first to 
uh, staged this play with all, you know, black cast at Harlem in New York. And that blew people's mind, like, because even at that point, uh, as much as you'd like to think post-Civil War, that everything's equal, <laughs> it's not. But the fact that he utilized art to kind of flatten the Cultural Revolution and basically say, hey, those guys, I mean, you know, we're going to invite them to put on a play and a classic, you know, Shakespearean play using all black casts. It's a sort of like similar to like Hamilton today, right? It's just like we're all thinking, wow, it's crazy, you know, um, with multiple parts being cast uh, with diversity. But back then, he was one of those guys that just didn't care about rules and he just did his own thing what he thought best and so things like that he conquered stage he staged multiple the theatrical plays that were just breakthroughs just amazing um stage as a general rule has always pushed the envelope usually right. when stage right. comes to film that goes through a lot of censorship right. because stage right. really knows no color it knows no boundaries and um that's why if I can, I like to compare a stage production with a movie production and see what they cut out from the play. Right. And then basically in a lot of his 20s, the next thing he moved on to was uh, radio. And on radio, he did a thing called the... Um, uh, I think he did a very short limited series for Les Miserables. Uh, he did an adaptation of the classic literature and he basically created stories around that that were just mind-blowing for radio of its time. You know, like the way we're doing podcasts today, well, people have been doing that since the early days of radio. And so he, like, he's been revolutionizing radio when he touched it. And basically, uh, he ultimately did a lot of uh, multiple episodes. He, uh, I forgot, I think the National Endowment Radio Theater Program, I forgot what the name of it's called, but they basically uh, allowed him to cr adapt classic works into a well, one hour, 45, 50 minute, one hour drama every week or something like that. And so he, he had a thing called uh, Mercury Theater on the Air, which uh, ran for a year, a year or a handful of some time. And then I think I listened to most of that. And they're brilliant. They're just, I yeah. mean, um, the War of the Worlds is only one of the broadcasts. And the reason why that's revolutionary is because he basically in, on radio people you know are were serious during news time where you had to basically you know like you know now it's the weather report so people report weather or now it's traffic and now it's you know news on whatever and people expect it at, at a certain time right especially when you like physically tune into a radio station you're expecting to listen to something well what he did was in that broadcast he pretended as if he was real life news and now back then of course there's no internet there wasn't even TV that we know of today. And so when people tune in, they expect, you know, real things. And when you mm -hmm. have an artist like this blurring reality in fiction and saying, the Martians have landed, you're going to freak out because you're going to think the Martians really have landed <laughs> in New Jersey and uh, wreaking havoc. And so that was one of those like uh, brilliant stroke of genius that he did was he blurred that line. You know, now nowadays we... We, we have a hard time believing what's real or not in the news just because of the surreal nature of news broadcast, radio, and just anything. But he loves that stuff. He loved blurring that line. And in fact, uh, his late career, uh, including the uh, unfinished film called The Other Side of the Wind, he loves to play with that reality, fiction, just the, what's the truth, you know, on video and, and playback and the stories and what's what's the truth in between. There are so many works of fiction nowadays that that tries to do something with that, uh, but Orson Welles got there first, especially with uh, the War of the Worlds. And later on, he would kind of uh, double down on that thought process. And of course, this is all happening before Citizen Kane. He did all of this uh, before getting to Citizen Kane, and after Citizen Kane, of course, you know, was which is a brilliant film, which usually top you know one, uh, top five, top ten. Out of a lot of the, um, whether it's the AFI, top whatever, sound and vision list. There's so many lists out there, usually. This is usually like top 10, usually, you know, on many, many multiple lists, especially for American films, one of the best, if not the best. Um, so it, it's just because of the way it, it's acted, it's uh, directed, uh, the cinematography is just insane and. 
broke a lot of rules. Um, the way sets are designed, the way the visual effects is done. You wouldn't think that there's a lot of visual effects, but there's a huge amount of uh, effects in this film. The way the story is written. Uh, just, you know, everything, everything from start to finish. It, it's this brilliantly realized film. And that's why people often throw it up there as the classic of our time, especially in American uh, conversations about film. In fact, there's still going to be a recent, um, I know you don't often pay attention to recent news, uh, Diane, but there's a, a director called David Fincher, who's one of the most famous directors today. Uh, he's actually uh, uh, going to be make. he already made this movie called Mank, which is the screenwriter Mankowitz. So his dad, who is now dead, uh, wrote a screenplay about uh, you know Herman Mankiewicz, <laughs> so he made a black and white movie about Mank. It's called Mank about uh, Mankiewicz, and how he made uh, Citizen Kane. So it's going to be on Netflix soon. Interesting. That'll be interesting. Yeah, I mean he loves classics. He's, he's like a film nerd like all of us, and so he'll he'll kind of bring that trope back in this conversation about Orson Welles and Citizen Kane is going to be resurrected again because we seem to kind Have of go seen- in cycles. <laughs> Have you seen Mank before? The movie? Yes, or is it not out yet? Oh, it's not out yet. Yeah, he made it, I think, pre-COVID. I don't know if he even completed it, but it's in the middle of editing, and I think it's going to be out in the next few months, if not within a year or something like that. Yeah, it's brand new. And uh, But his dad, I think, passed away earlier, more than 10 years ago. I can't remember when. And one of the last things he did was a screenplay, screenplay for it. But um, yeah, it'll be interesting. So anytime modern artist tries to tackle the classic era like this, it's always I always get interested in how, what their take on it is, you know, from today's perspective. But Diane, like you said later on, you know, he tries to make more movies like Magnificent Ambersons and many many works. I've seen most of them, and uh, it's honestly just really tough to judge because he it basically without. Uh, not the McCarthy blacklist, but basically from an artistic perspective, he was blacklisted uh, from spending money on his film. So many of his films suffered. But then you got, you know, great, sometimes great movies like The Trial or um, he, he did a... The uh, Third Man. Yeah, well, he was only a, a actor in that, even though he half had sort of directing hands in that. But the point is, um, you know, he made a lot of works afterwards. And I think towards the end of his life, he did a lot of stuff like F for fake. And then ultimately yes. that res- resulted in stuff like um, the Arcadian file. And then also the, um, uh, the other side of the wind, which is supposed to be his magnum opus, which has now been made. I don't know if you know of this, but the, um, Peter uh, Bogdanovich, uh, I think that's how you pronounce the name. Bogdanovich. Uh, yeah, he complete because, you know, they were good friends towards the end of his life. And uh, he completed that movie, helped completed that movie on his behalf. And Netflix paid the money for it and sorted out all the legal wranglings. And basically, it's done. It's on Netflix. Yeah, just so you know, for the audience, if they don't know that. For a long time, it, for 20, 30 years plus, it was like this mythic, like, unfinished last work of Orson Welles that it will never see the light of day until it did. And it's not perfect. It's very similar to F or Fake. And what he loves to do with uh, what we just talked about the the world of the world blurring uh, truth and fiction. But it, but enough about that. Anything else you've seen? <laughs> let's let's go back to the silent era. <laughs> well, one thing I wanted to bring up was just that I think you were when you were talking about Wells. Uh, did you mean that he won the PBD Award? Because it said he won it in, or he was not. He received a special PBD Award in 1958, and then. I believe he got it later next year. I don't know what awards he's won, but um, I just know. I thought that's yeah. I thought that's what you had been mentioning. Uh, he's, I I don't. I know I that he and Mankiewicz won the best writing Oscar for that year for Citizen right. Kane. Right. Right. But but I don't know of any other awards. Yeah, basically. Like uh, Dan mentioned earlier, uh, Hearst basically buried him because he was he owned all the news media at that point. And so what he felt like was a criticism of his own personal life. Uh, basically, he buried him. And uh, that's that film, 
uh, Citizen Kane was not successful until a few decades later when it was resurrected. So it didn't get popular during the 40s when it first came out. In fact, it got buried in, in, amongst many, many other films. It's really the golden age of, of black and white cinema in the 30s and 40s. And it wasn't until I probably like 50s, 60s, towards the start of the film school generation that it got revived. There you go. Wow. Hmm. Um. Okay, so uh, any other movies? <laughs> I didn't realize it's going to go off on a Citizen Kane t- tangent. <laughs> Any other uh, classics, uh, Diane? Casablanca? No, of I'm course. really going to set you off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Casablanca, um, which was supposed to be a B film, but turned out to be one of those top 10 films that people really love. Um, the more I see it, the more I get out of it. I love uh, the elements that went into that film. When I was younger, I didn't understand it as much or appreciate it. But uh, now I can, it's a film that I can watch any time like Citizen Kane and not be bored by it. Yeah, these are all, these are all like the mega classics of our time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... It's a miracle that film came out the way it did because it changed hands multiple times, had multiple directors worked on it. It's a product of the studio machine of its time, and it's just a miracle that it came out the way it did. It really literally yes. was a, a, a team effort with multiple hands, different directions. It's just shocking that it, it's, it's the way it is due to its history. You've seen that, Lily? Casablanca? Uh, no, that's one I've only seen parts of. I never got a chance to watch it on TCM with my mom or even when it was just on TV because it was never a, a convenient time. But it is a movie I'd like to see, especially now that knowing Conrad Veidt's in it as a... Is he a bad guy? I'm not exactly sure what his role he's is a, in that he's film. He's a Nazi, Lily. He's a Nazi. Oh, he's a Nazi. He's a Nazi. He's a bad guy. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, who I really like is Claude Rains. Of course. Mm. He plays course. the um, Vichy Frenchman or French officer who uh, sort of taking money out of the pockets out of both sides. Yeah. And um, sort of the villain with a heart of gold. And uh, as he and Bogey walk into the dark of the hangar, this is the start of a beautiful friendship, Louie. Hmm. <laughs> oh, did I give it away to you, Lily? I'm sorry. No, it's all good. <laughs> that's okay. okay uh, I'll good. still watch it. Lily watches movies in pieces, so that's one thing. Yeah, I it, about Lily. <laughs> that is. Yeah, that is how I've literally seen a big chunk of movies these days. Yep. Movies in pieces. That's right. Have you seen it? Yep. Did you watch the whole thing? What'd you think? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Anywho, um, how about you, Lily? Uh, I, uh, by the way, did you watch anything else, uh, Diane? Or um, just what has been in the plans uh, through the podcast? Okay, cool. I just want to make sure we're not cutting you off, uh, Lily. Anything in the classic realm? I know you're busy these days. No, I haven't had a chance to watch anything else, which is sad. No, no movies being made. No movies already made. Not this week. <laughs> right. Yeah, I don't oh, think... Oh, I did uh, see the... the uh, go ahead. Sorry. I did see The King's Speech. Oh, that's oh, yes. a good... I have seen that movie all the way through. It's oh, a good movie. Oh, we found oh, one. Yay. <laughs> so how did film. you love it? Uh, I watched it a few years ago. Very good. Um, That's Colin Firth, right? Who's playing the king? Yes. Yeah. 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 Was, wasn't he marvelous? Mm-hmm. It's been it's been a while because I remember I think Helena Bonham Carter's in that too. She also does a really good job. I thought, I mean, I don't remember it quite so much now, but just when they have the straight shots with no cutaways on him, it's really good. It's really powerful. I think it won some awards mm-hmm. with the Academy. I just can't remember which ones. Maybe Best Actor. 
or maybe it was yeah i best think picture. a few of them are nominated it might have won best picture but i think one or both of them were at le- well they were both nominated for a role at that point at the time of the film but i don't know if it was because of this film oh i think i think it won uh it did win the best uh best picture of that year yeah so it won uh let's well see, it certainly it deserved it best picture director actor and screenplay for that wow. year for the uh what year is it? 2010 i guess i was gonna say what? about 10 years ago it came out yeah roughly 2010 yeah anywho all right well cool. time flies when you're having films you know yeah <laughs> All right, so I, I think that uh, about does it for uh, what we've been watching this week. Uh, I, I don't remember if I uh, watched anything recently. But uh, anyways, let's get into um, Robert Wien's uh, 1923 I-N-R-I, uh, which stands for... In Latin. It? Yes. Do you want to read it? Do you know how? <laughs> Um, I don't know Latin, but I think basically it's, uh, King of the Jews. Yeah, that's what it translates to, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, long time ago, this is, uh, high school Latin, it's, uh, Jesus Nazarenus Rex uh, Judeorum, which is, uh, like you said, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews, which is in John 19, 1920 or something like that. It was re- written according to that scripture in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek for all to see. And so, hence, I-N-R-I, or the Greek version is I-N-B-I. And hence, that's essentially the title of this film, 1923, directed by Robert Lean. Stars uh, Gregory Chimera, uh, Henny Porton, Asta Nelson. I'm not sure I know if they star in something else I've, I've seen. But it essentially oh, Henny, is the Passion Act. Henny was a comedian, Important. which is very interesting. Hmm. Okay. okay. She had a very okay. interesting life. And I'm, yeah. uh, I've seen a couple of her movies, and she's just wild. Yeah, she's an um, actress, yeah. film producer of the silent era from 1890 to, well, that's when she was born. She starred in 170 films from 1906 to 1955. Wow. So many, many, many films, especially from the German German film industry. And I'm especially fond of my girl, Asta Nielsen, who unfortunately got a very small part in this film. Right. I would have loved to have seen her more. And that's another film that I saw the other day was The uh, Baby Eskimo, which is a great comedy. And uh, she was the star. And I don't think there was a scene she wasn't in. So that sort of made up for it for me because I really (laughs) like her as an actress. Oh, good. But uh, she played um, Mary Magdalene in this one. And uh, Henny played a very subdued uh mary right so there were very subdued performances so essentially it's kind of the passion act you know i don't know if you guys are aware but in many countries uh outside of the u.s i'm not aware of any maybe they do perform this but sometime around easter before easter uh, a lot of places in latin america a lot of places in europe they would reenact sort of the 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 the, the passion, the, like the Obergamera in uh, yeah in Europe. Yeah, so essentially, it's like the road to the cross and stuff like that. They reenact that in like as a, it's a big sort of celebration slash holiday type uh, for both religious and also probably cultural purposes uh, across many Western countries. I think so. I feel like it, because that's been around since before movies were even made. So that culturally has been around for ages, you know. So I think culturally it's been people's lives for a long time. And this film is an adaptation, I think, of both those things and also just, you know, of uh, obviously, you know, the story. And oh, I, that's what it was. It was based on a novel in 1905 by Peter Rosiger. And uh, this film was reissued in 1933 in the U.S. with added music track 
and the title and narration, the title being The Crown of Thorns. But the way that uh, he made this was kind of unique, at least according to the Wikipedia. He, he set this in modern Russia, and then he used the character of Judas Iscariot as a social revolutionary who wants Jesus to become a leader of the Jews from a political perspective, not nothing to do more with his deity to rise against uh, Roman army so it's very political from his portrayal although I didn't really get that when I was watching the movie <laughs> mm, well yeah, because yeah, there's yeah, footage yeah. missing yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right Lily yeah. so overall thoughts uh, let's start with Diane what, what do you think overall thoughts well I've watched a lot of uh, films on Christ from Silent uh, Manger to the Cross all the way up through modern times to um, Jesus Christ Superstar. I don't know why I'm attracted to these films, but each film has a different take on the uh, Passion of Christ. And I, I sat through this whole thing, and if you're expecting expressionism from Ween from this film, in my mind, you're not going to get it. He played it um, more biblically, but I'm not sure he knew what he was thinking. Um, he starts out with the birth of Christ, and then he went, he jumped to uh, Jesus uh, talking with the elders, which actually is my favorite scene in the film, where you have a young child talking to the elders about religion according to the Torah, but there were a couple of unintentionally funny moments, and I don't know if it was from the way that they took the language and uh, translated it. Pilot, who is played by Werner Krauss, who is a Wien stock player, plays Pilot, and he's lolling around on his couch and some concerned citizens come to him and they say there's a man and he's, you know, claiming he's healing people and bringing the dead back to life. And Pilate sort of throws his hand back and says, oh, not another one. And I thought that that was sort of intentionally amusing. And there was another part where uh, Christ is brought before him and he says so I hear you're the king of the Jews Christ says you said it so yeah I, I thought, laughed when he said that <laughs> sorry Diana. did you did you get that I did. no I laughed too you said it I know it's just like you know how we would say it you said it it's just like oh my gosh like, yeah. what is this translation <laughs> but sorry continue <laughs> No, I got it too. Um, I also thought that Jesus was played sort of like a zombie. He didn't really. Yeah, he was very subdued. You know, when he said. Character. Yeah, he was character. not just subdued, but he had these rings around his eyes and he's in this hair that was just really greasy. He, was, he looked more like Rasputin to me with blonde hair. And he's saying, bring the little children unto me. And they're all cute little kids. And here's Christ. And he's got this look on his face. It's not full of love. It's not, uh, he doesn't have a um, kind of personality that you see in other films about Christ. Yeah, it's unintentionally creepy to me. <laughs> Yeah. I was like, well, that's right. a little weird. <laughs> right. I think that even Iggy Pop could have pulled it off better. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, it wasn't a satisfying film to me. It missed opportunities that you get from the, the story that you read in the Bible or several translations. I'd agree with that, yeah. I'm spoiled more by uh, Jamil's version who said famously, we don't need a script. We already have one. It's the Bible. 
And then he has Mary Magdalene saying, I'm going out to find a carpenter. And we all remember that, which not, never happened. So he put his own bit of amusement and he couldn't do it without a leopard, you know what I mean? So this version, I thought I would see more. I think that what Ween did with the light was the most interesting thing about it. Why do we always see The Last Supper the way that Da Vinci painted it? This was another film that did it like that. Yeah, because it's just so influential, right? Everybody wants to uh, reframe this like those Renaissance paintings because it's been around for hundreds of years and they just love to have that uh, imagery uh, play out. It's I think it's seeped. If you're into the arts in general, it's just unavoidable. You know what I mean? That that framing, that imagery. Mm. Um, but I agree with you. Yeah, I, I it, it could have been better. Um, I think the highlight for me uh, is just, you know, what expressionism, German expressionism does exist are the, in the sets, the large gargantuan sets and the cast of at least hundreds of people of extras. It's just, you can tell that they spare no expenses. I think this was shot over 90 days between nine, uh, May and September 1923 in berlin and it, it was that those star casts expensive sets uh ac just hundreds of extras and the scale and length is probably the largest that uh, we never directed which is uh i think to his detriment uh, so far we've been watching a lot of robert Wien films uh f throughout his filmography and earlier on i can't remember which movie i made a comment that robert Wien's focus at least all the films that we had watched up to that point, uh, even last week, has been primarily have to do with uh, sort of the human consciousness of what is real and what isn't real. Uh, Caligari, of course, is one of the uh, big examples that he's known for, but many of his other films that we've seen so far have pretty much touched upon the same themes of uh, reality versus what's happening in dreams. And a lot of sort of, you know, Freud, Jungian, very psychological slash deep psychosis and sort of uh, sort of the, I don't know, I guess the, the inner dialogues uh, in the darkness of people's minds and the recesses of the, the dark recesses of people's minds. He loves to explore all those feeling, things. And my comment earlier was, let's see if he actually will do this in this movie. Because uh, I had never seen it. And I was like, I, I don't know what he's going to do with it. But uh, I don't know what he's gonna, how he's going to treat it, if he's going to bring the same aesthetic approach. And like you, Diana, I was just shocked that it was him directing this movie. He basically, all of his uh, characteristics that makes a Robert Wien film... It's completely absent in this movie. <laughs> Everything that makes him who he is is completely gone. It's like stripped away. It's almost like um, a modern day uh, director who is making a movie for money, right? And so he's, I, I don't know if he's made a lot of movie, uh, money out of this. Maybe he did it for money or maybe uh, producers or somebody put pressure on him to do this film a certain way. I don't know. I, I don't know a lot of backstory about this film, but how it, came out was pretty in my opinion bland for somebody so who's capable of visually striking films who with incredible deep insights into human darkness uh i feel like he could have done so much especially with the judas character you know that's like that that character would have been one of his characters or straight out of any of his films you know the darkness of judas and his betrayal and uh his consciousness eating at him right in his suicide, yeah. like I would have been like, wow, that I just was almost excited about his take on a character like that in his universe. But unfortunately, you know, he just made a plain vanilla. Uh, I don't know. I mean, for uh, amount of money spent, I, I don't know. It just came out pretty bland to me. Other than the sets, the cast is impressive. All the uh, costume design, all, all of the basic aesthetics that you expect with somebody who has had theatrical 
experience at firsthand acting and all those things which he had you know and and all those basic things that he he's really good at it you know but um but yeah this one missed yeah. and not just by a little bit this missed this could have been directed by anybody exactly it yeah. didn't have his fingerprint on it you know i yeah. did i did see some vintage behind the scenes footage where they show the crew and he's got at least six cameras set up all cranking away hmm. and this was even for the scene the opening scene where christ is born and that's a very still scene that's that's a tableau scene there's no real movement in it there's no real drama in it it's just everybody stands still click and that's it. But you've got six cameras grinding away. And I don't know what they were, what he was going for when he put that many people behind the camera. Because mm, I wasn't really impressed. Interesting. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't know what happened. So, but uh, definitely, you know, the, the things that we expect from him, I think were great. Uh, but in terms of like set design, backgrounds and stuff like that. But the things that I expected him to do more of, like I just talked about, wasn't there. So, um, what'd you think about that, uh, Lily? What'd you think of the movie? Well, I'll, I just have two notes. I think you mentioned it, uh, your note about what you just said in last week's episode of Raskolnikov, where, you know, he's always bringing the psychological themes into films. I think that's a podcast we you mentioned it on. But, um... Uh, kind of uh, this is to add on to your response to Diane about like you know you've seen so many of these Jesus Christ retellings it's like I don't know my note that I had for myself is like why do we feel the need to retell the story of Christ but then it's like why do we have to retell any type of story I mean is it just to keep it fresh is it just to take a new spin on it I mean it's like creative licensure license with uh any story so it was just kind of for me i with the pieces missing from it there definitely was part of that story you don't know what he's trying to do with it it was just another kind of boredom movie for me if we weren't watching the podcast it would have <laughs> we weren't watching the podcast if we weren't talking in the podcast i wouldn't have watched it it, um, it didn't help that the music for it was lost either. So even just trying to find some type of, I don't know, I listen to lo-fi jazz or whatever I can find that might equal what I'm watching. So that doesn't really help because you're trying to balance out the sound compared to the film itself and make sure it's not going to take away from what you're watching. But at the same time, if what you're watching is dull, then what's the point? And seeing as there's already so many of these remakes of NI and INRI, you know, it's just like, well, you could just watch the newest one or even an older one. Because we watched Alice Gee's around Easter this year, I believe. And then just in comparison, I, I can't remember what year hers was, but I would have rather watched hers again than have to sit through this. <sighs> so... Th that's just kind of my take. Um, I thought it was kind of funny, though, too. I kind of liked how Jesus was portrayed, even though it was very plain stares. There was... 1903, like, by the way. The oh, LSD thank you. One. 1903. Right. See, that's 20 years earlier. That's so much better. But, you know, the cuts have been saved and it's been restored. Uh, but, you know, for me, I kind of liked the way Jesus was kind of really mopey dopey. Because it's kind of, you know, he's supposed to be the prophet, so he knows what's going to happen. So no wonder he's miserable. <laughs> I mean. It's your he's... emo Jesus right there, right? <laughs> <laughs> emo Jesus. <laughs> but I get it, though. It's just he is, you know, it's a lot of deep staring into your soul. and But even when he was with Pontius Pilate, it was kind of, he was the straight man and Pilate was kind of like, the hoity-toity kind of guy, even though he's not even like that. So, but yeah, what for me, I didn't realize Robert Ween had directed this film either, so that was very interesting. Um, I was reading online, so for the film version we watched, 
Dutch, the original subtitles, at least in this, were Czech. So we were able to switch them. Um, I don't know. I don't have too many notes on the film. Um, towards the very end, though, when Jesus is dying on the cross, do we know if that was supposed to be Mary and Mary Magdalene coming to his rescue, or was it Veronica? I think it was Mary and Mary Magdalene. Because she... Yeah. Yep. Okay, I couldn't get that. And they were just sort of creeping in there, and it didn't seem to be a big deal at all. I mean, with all the things that I've seen and read... There was lots of activity going on while that was happening. You know, the soldiers were casting lots for his garments. Uh, Mary was uh, crying at the base of the cross. He had the two um, other crucified uh, thieves behind him. Um, and... Ween didn't take advantage of any of that. And he could have uh, zeroed in on various things. He didn't even zero in on Jesus. Yeah, that's true. Jesus was kind of, I mean, he's supposed to be getting murdered, but he still was very creepy and kind of just, it. I mean, it's meant to be a bit unsettling because, you know, someone's being crucified right in front of you, especially when you have the close-ups. But still, it was kind of, not you couldn't get across ugh, i don't know it's kind of hard to explain because you know you have the actor and then you have the story you would think jesus would be i don't know i can't say it right he's supposed to be pitying the people who's killing him and then it it doesn't come across that way in the film which is fine because you know whatever creative license but it was also kind of a strange ending before he dies. I don't know. It's hard, kind of hard to explain without, like, visually seeing it in front of me right now. If he would have gone into the character of, oh, how can I forget him? He's the one who kissed Jesus. Oh, Judas. Judas. If he could have gone into more of the characters like he did for Judas... That would have been a more satisfying film for me, mm. but he didn't. You could have called the film Judas, and it would have made more sense. <laughs> Judas doesn't always go out by hanging himself. I saw a version, maybe it was the greatest story ever told, and he threw himself into the fire. And if you know the story, he hung himself. I mean, that's the story. That's how it's written. That's right. how it comes down through history. Yep. But yep. they're taking license. Oh, wouldn't this be cool if he threw himself into a fire pit? Right. Instead of hanging himself? Right. So. I mean, I guess we don't I didn't mean, I guess. see it. As far as I know, we didn't see it. I don't know. I don't know. No, we didn't. No, suppose there'll be half an hour or 45 minutes missing, I think. This yeah. This is still the incomplete, incomplete cut, so. Yeah. Well, that's like taking the Ten Commandments and cutting out DeMille's modern version. And I like his biblical version much more than I like throwing modern sensibility into the film. I never could understand that. But that's DeMille. Give the people what they want. Of course. Mm. I think with the way the film ends, too, it's on such a rough note because it obviously seems like after Jesus dies, that part of the film is missing. Because uh, the end, the intertitle card ends with the guy saying, I think that's a Roman soldier, this is not a human being. And then it kind of holds it there, and then the movie cuts out. So you're just kind of like, what? <laughs> I mean, obviously, he's the son of God, so he's not a normal human being. But I don't know, just having it end there kind of makes you even dislike the film a little bit more in a weird sense, not at any fault because of the lost footage. It's just kind of such an unsatisfying ending, at least on my part. Because I just, I don't know, you're kind of just like, yeah, and it's the biggest cliffhanger ever. <laughs> Even though we right. all know what happens. <laughs> I don't know. What's your thought, Ifong? <laughs> 
Well, my favorite version is uh, Jamil's version, despite his um, showmanship. But there's a, an early version, I don't know if ever either one of you have seen it, called From the Manger to the Cross. And that was made in 1912. And the actor's name was John Henderson Bland, who is a very unusual dude anyway. Mm -hmm. He um, dressed as Christ, he had long hair like Christ, and he behaved like Christ. And they made this film in the Holy Land. It was one of the first that was made on location. And they took a trip on a ship over there, and he was Jesus all across the crossing. He played the part very well, given the time and characterizations, but that film actually made me cry. I'm so a sucker for crucifixions, and yeah, they usually bring out the emotion. Uh, this is 1912 version, uh, filmed on the of Egypt in Palestine, directed by uh, yes. Sarah Olcott. Correct. Uh, actress, screenwriter, Jean Coutier, and uh, I think she portrayed Virgin Mary in it too. Uh, got re-released. Yes in uh, 1919 as well, Vitagraph Studios. Yeah, they took it over. It was Calum that first produced it. Right. But it had more feeling to it. I got the feeling that Robert Henderson Bland played a Christ, that he really believed he was Christ. Of course, you know, that film uh, utilized James Tussauds paint the watercolors, the life and death of our Jesus Christ, the 1896, 1897 uh, watercolor paintings for the tablet. Which I have not That's seen. Tablet. Yeah, so it, it's the, he's a, uh, an artist who drew 350 plus uh, watercolors. Um, and he's one of the, I don't know if the very first, who knows if he's actually the very first, but he's an artist who traveled to Palestine and did primary research took some still photography, then came back and did a uh, watercolor painting, um, I don't know if you call it painting, just watercolors, of the still photography he made and uh, basically tracking uh, the life of Jesus, you know, from birth, life, death, all the way through. And uh, his paintings were so influential culturally that it was the basis for the Alice Guy Plachet adaptation, 1903. And of course... Uh, you know, Herbert Reynolds, you know, and, and also the head of Caleb, uh, Frank Marion looked at this copy, like physical printout, like the, the watercolors. And it was on tour uh, from everywhere. And right now, uh, the Brooklyn Museum of Fine Arts owns it. I don't think they've took taken it out to uh, display for a long time. But in the 1920s, oh, they used to constantly be taken out. And uh, a lot of people... Uh, loved it and it was very highly influential culturally just across the board and it inspired a lot of things including films of course uh, but uh, a lot of Jesus movies were essentially inspired by that um, just as a side note uh, for our library local library I actually was able to borrow a complete uh, watercolor beautifully rendered on a really large print uh, book from some library network locally. So I got lucky because Boston has one of the best libraries in the country. But I don't know right. out there if you're capable of accessing your library network to get that. But for us, I was able to actually firsthand uh, not visit the museum. That would have been even better, but at least look at all of the watercolors for when we were doing our podcast for reviewing the uh, that episode for Alex Key's work. So That's fabulous. Yeah, anyways. So it doesn't surprise me that inspired him. And of course, this inspired, um, I think, uh, the Robert Robert Wien film as well. So any parting thoughts or additional thoughts or parting thoughts about this uh, particular work? I really don't have anything else to add other than um, that it was... Uh, production wise the physical sets and everything was beautifully rendered and but in terms of the story and characterization uh, i due to the thing that we just watched the filmography of 
this director, I really expected way more than kind of this lackluster effort. Mm. So, anyways, that's my take on it. So, any last well, uh, parting thoughts from you guys? Well, I have this one when I was doing information searching. Uh, I found a small kind of blog about the film and this is from a guy named brad who gave it about three and a half stars i'm just gonna kind of read what he wrote i'm not sure if it really needs to be in the show notes but i guess i could link to the website just because i suppose that's a friendly thing to do (laughs) (laughs) um and they they're all talking about the online youtube version right despite this and other imperfections on the available copy ween's telling of the passion is mostly conventional yet visually striking his Jesus is ghostly, dark expressionistic circles around his eyes which convey the inevitability of his death. Ween's framing of the Last Supper in particular feels otherworldly, framed symmetrically with the actors moving slowly, creating a meditative tableau that allows the moment to embody the full spiritual meaning. Meanwhile, the crowd sequences seem to borrow from Hollywood epics, and he mentions Griffith's intolerance, and combined makes INRI one of the more impressive tellings of the New Testament I've seen. Now, obviously, we're talking about this way after this review was put online, but it's just kind of, I just kind of wanted to bring it up that because we have one opinion, that doesn't mean we're the end-all be-all. Just kind of interesting because I kind of agree with what this guy Brad mentioned because some of the p- parts of this film are kind of visually stunning despite being a little dull and lackluster. So I don't know. I just kind of want to throw that in the podcast. I thought it was interesting, but for me, I personally don't have anything left to talk about. That guy did it for me, <laughs> so that's what I have to agree with, and I guess that's my thought. Yeah, I mean, certainly our uh, opinion isn't the be-all, end-all. It's just kind of what we think. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's kind of the, right. the point of the podcast. So we kind of voice yeah. our opinions. And, of course, you know, anybody. I, I mean, Diane, you can tell us. I mean, this is you, you've been there, I think, way longer than any of us. It, uh, you know, it, one person's opinion about a movie is is going to be very different than another person's opinion. You know, one person can label the silent film a classic and the other could say, yeah. eh you know, about that movie, same movie, right? It can be watched by different eyes from different perspectives from different people, right? Right. I mean, but that includes... But this movie I mean, did not draw me in emotionally at all. Right. It just didn't. And I was hoping that it would because it is a story of emotion, great emotion. And we he didn't even get, you know... Um, he went through a lashing of 39 lashes. We didn't get that. Not that I'm looking for violence, but we're looking for what Jesus went through and what people were seeing and how they were affected. In fact, I found an even smaller review by um, Louis de Koss. Uh He said that it was the fifth film of Ween that he had seen and he wasn't very impressed. The story only covers the most famous parts that everybody knows about Jesus. Even if you're not religious, you may know a lot of this story. And after all, the execution and the outcome feels shallow. The beginning is confusing. The acting is very meh. It doesn't feel realistic and neither expression is except in some minimal parts. I think it is incomplete, but I don't think the 40 missing minutes could help. So I wish I could say, hooray, this was a uh, hidden treasure. But uh, for me, it really wasn't. But I can say that I watched it. Yep. So there you have it. That's our that's our take on this film of Robert Wayne's. So um thank you diane thank you lily and uh you can find more of our stuff at watching silent films dot wordpress dot com again that's watching silent films dot wordpress dot com and you can send us email at watching silent films plural at gmail dot com and you can find more of diane's stuff at the facebook uh group uh first you gotta log into facebook dot com and you just search for 
the silence majority. Um, it's going to be one of the uh, 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 private, or is it a public group, I guess. Not private group, but it is a public it's group. It's a public you can group. check and interact with her and you find more. But it's, it's important to put way back. Otherwise, you're going to get the silence majority political groups. Got it. So make sure you add in the silence majority, the way back machine, and that will get, land you on the correct page. It should. Yeah. It should. No politics on your page, right? <laughs> no politics. No. Even the slightest bit, not a whiff. Okay. So uh, I leave that for other people. Yeah. So thank you, listeners. And uh, if you wouldn't mind reading, uh, leaving a star rating or uh, perhaps some reviews, it would help other film fans uh, find our podcasts, uh, especially on Apple Podcast platform, but really any other platform you find us through. So thank you, listeners. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Lily. And we'll look forward to chatting with you next week. Thank you and have a good night.